Hello, thank you for joining us. The program will begin in 10 minutes. Hello and welcome. The program will begin in five minutes. Please find your seat.
Thank you for joining us at the Civic Learning Week National Forum. The program is about to begin. Please be seated. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you again for joining us at the Civic Learning Week National Forum. The program is about to begin. Please be seated. Please welcome to the stage Louise Dubé of iCivics. Wow, it's great to see you all here. Um, on behalf of the Civic Learning Week Steering Committee, our incredible sponsors, the Civics Now Coalition, all 330 of you, and iCivics, I welcome you to the second annual Civic Learning Week. Thank you for being here. Our community conceived of Civic Learning Week to showcase what civic learning is and how it can serve to be a unifying force for our country, especially at this time where young people are losing faith in our country, in our system of governance. We'll have programming online all week across the nation, as well as the exciting program here today at George Washington University. As many of you know, iCivics lost its founder, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, in December. It was a really sad event for us, but coming over here this morning, I was thinking she would be so happy and so proud to see all of you here today, joined in the notion that our nation must invest 
in civic learning if we are to maintain a healthy constitutional democracy. So thank you for doing that. 80% of Americans are with you. 80% right? of Americans believe that this is necessary for us to maintain a healthy democracy. But of course, today is a difficult time for our country. We're facing deep, fundamental divisions. We're going into a highly polarized election cycle. I'm not going to belabor the point. This kind of situation can have you feeling down. I myself have felt pretty bad many times. Even the word hope can be controversial. Can you imagine? And while election cycles are designed to solve some of these tensions, it may well be that this time one cycle is not going to do it, and we're not going to be able to resolve all tensions at once. But what is absolutely clear is that our country must and will go forward. How? I have no idea. We don't know. It's not clear. I am not, I don't uh, read tarot cards, so any of us do. We have what is absolutely essential is that we have a lot of work to do. We have work to do to repair the civic, frayed civic fabric of our country. 300 of us decided to do that. And we proposed a roadmap. It's called Educating for American Democracy. It's not a national curriculum. It's a roadmap. It's full of challenging and difficult questions around national themes. It asks Americans, what are the duties and the responsibilities of, our, of a citizen in this country, for example? It asks Americans to look at to the past to understand how to act today. It asks us to investigate our civic infrastructure against our ideals. For us, the authors, and there are 300 of us, it was an act of love for our country, act of love for the Declaration of Independence, and it was an act of love for our Constitution, despite our many, many flaws. For educators who do this work every day, and many of you are here in the room today or online, it is an act of courage at times. It is also an investment in the promise that young people are to this country. And to you, we say thank you, and please keep going. What am I talking about, the promise of young people? I'm going to tell you one example. Mr. Wessel from Virginia. We have the Secretary of Education later on in Virginia. Thought it'd be nice to be a shout out to her, her state. Mr. Wessel teaches civics in 12th grade. He has a civics research project. That involves looking at an issue, an issue that's close to you, close to the students, close to your community, close to your school. One of the kids in the class had a friend. The friend had a broken leg. And the friend was always late to class. So, wait, why are you late? Can't get from the parking lot to the entrance really easily. So the kids, the group of kids decided, okay, let's look at that. And they, count, they did a lot of research. They counted the number of accessible parking spots and how long it took to get from there to the entrance. And they realized that the number of parking spots was not compliant with even the local regulations, forget about the ADA, about how many accessible parking spots you needed. So they did some research, legal research. They did some budgeting. They looked at how much it would cost to have a ramp. Then they looked at um, a temporary solution if you don't have money. So they proposed all of that to the school committee. And the school committee decided to create a few ex more accessible parking spots, thereby making their community better in little small ways. That is what civic education is about. So even then, those 12th graders have been already making a difference in their community. So while we all want to teach, we have to remember that students want to learn. They want to feel like they have a path forward in their lives and for their communities. So despite all the polarization and all the negative news and all of that, we as a movement, all of you, we have made a tremendous amount of progress 
even in the last year since Civic Learning Week, the first Civic Learning Week a year ago. To cite just a few examples, the federal funding that was increased last year provided high quality civic learning to 400,000 students. There are 14 states passed legislations to bolster civic learning in accordance to the Civics Now policy menu. That is amazing, including fantastic bills in New Hampshire with middle school civics. That bill was sponsored and led by the, our coalition, the New Hampshire Civics. Uh, Montana and Minnesota passed uh, new high school requirements. The pilots for the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap now serve almost 190 thousand students. We have built a research agenda. You're going to hear Joe Kahn talk about this in a minute. And many of us in this community are getting organized to celebrate the annual, the 250th birthday of our nation in 2026. That is an immense amount of progress. Give yourselves a round of applause for what you've accomplished. Today, what are we going to do? We're going to talk tech. We have a digital democracy that is really different than what we've had in the past. We have to teach students how to detect myths and disinformation. And with the advent of AI, this is about to get worse. So we're going to talk about all of those things. Have there been one single conversations in your lives in the last six months that didn't involve AI? But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll delve a little bit more deeply with some experts in that. Then after that, we're going to uh, give you examples. So I've talked about a lot of progress. I've talked about the polarization. But we want to talk about what does that look like in real communities at the state level, at the local level, and at the higher ed level. What does that look like to make progress despite divisions and polarization. And then we're going to try to answer the question, can we teach about the election in this context right now? And we're going to hear from students, and we're going to hear from teachers out in the field. And then we're going to have little breaks for research so you can learn about the new research that's getting released today from all of our research partners. And then, of course, we're going to have, I don't need to give them any more plug than they already need, uh, the two justices, uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Amy Coney Barrett, are going to talk about the importance of civic learning together. And then lastly, tonight, we're going to have a great program at the archives with the Archivist of the United States, Colleen Shogan, and interviewing uh, Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. Uh, and so I hope that you join us for that. I cannot leave this stage without thanking individually each of our sponsors, without whom we could not do this. Thank you so much to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, to the Honey W. Nashman Center for Civic Engagement and Public Service at George Washington U University, the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Microsoft, the More Perfect Initiative doing great work on democracy, More Perfect Union, the National Archives, the National Archives Foundation, and the National Council for Social Studies. Thank you so much to all of you. <laughs> Finally, as you listen today, think about how civic learning can be a unifying force for our country, and tweet or do whatever it is that you want on social media at at National CLW. Thank you and enjoy the program. And now a research talk led by Joseph Kahn of the Civic Engagement Research Group at the University of California, Riverside. Good morning, good morning everyone. Um, one of my favorite teaching stories is about a professor who failed to pr prepare for his class. And so on the way to class, he thought to himself, it's no problem, I'll ask a good question and I'll just facilitate for 50 minutes. And so he got to class, the kids came in, and he began. 
He asked, what's worse for democracy, ignorance or apathy? Everybody was quiet. And he got a little more nervous, and then he, he asked again, which is worse for democracy, I ignorance or apathy? And after what felt like a very long time, a shy boy, a quiet boy in the front raised his hand and said, I don't know, and I don't care. The story comes to mind, you know, as we're all reading uh, about the upcoming election and the fact that young people are showing less enthusiasm for that election than uh, they did in 2020. And while youth interest in the election is down, that story or that apocryphal story gets the key facts wrong. Um, my name is Joe Kahn. I'm a professor at the University of California, Riverside, and I chair, co-chair something called the Educating for American uh, democracy Research Task Force, and one chief goal of the task force is to synthesize what we currently know from research. And today, exciting, we're releasing our first three research briefs. Um, they're on the table outside, and uh, for those of you online, uh, they are, are linked um, online. One thing the research summaries make clear is that youth apathy and ignorance isn't the problem. Um, as folks, I think, in this room uh, know very well and folks watching know very well, youth care about many things uh, and many political issues, and they not only know a lot about those issues, but they are very open to learning more when the right opportunities are presented. Um, but the way we pursue civic education uh, doesn't always achieve its potential. So what do these uh, research briefs show? Well, the first brief is on civic knowledge by David Campbell. Um, rigorous studies show that implementation of high quality assessments and accountability structures lead to increases in young people's civic knowledge. Students also learn more knowledge when they're in classrooms where civic and political issues are discussed freely and openly. In short, there are many ways to advance civic knowledge quite substantively. There are not many ways to advance this thing. <laughs> there we go. Inqui the second brief is on inquiry, viewpoint pluralism, and student engagement. Kelly Siegel Steckler uh, wrote that one for us. Um, and that brief highlights really that old school textbooks uh, are often quite insufficient. But when students learn by framing key questions and pursuing inquiry, often with substantive discussion, um, it promotes both student engagement and deeper understanding. Um, and, and big gains can be realized. The third brief is on social and emotional learning. And that brief examines the ways social and emotional learning can support civic outcomes. Students find that, uh, studies, excuse me, find that SEL and civic learning are often uh, mutually reinforcing. Uh, students' social, cognitive, and uh, emotional skills can help them critically and collaboratively examine societal issues and importantly act in relation to those issues. And they can deploy these SEL skills in understanding not only when they're learning and discussing, but also when they're engaging and acting with others. So if you read the briefs, you'll find more good stuff. So I've really just hit the top lines. Um, and, and these aren't the only topics, obviously, where research has demonstrated meaningful opportunities in terms of civic learning. Um, we'll release our next three briefs uh, before summer. But here's the bottom line. There's a great deal we can do as civic educators where we can be confident we will support young people to develop civic capacities and commitments and to strengthen the ways we engage in democracy. Unfortunately, educational leaders and elected officials often don't prioritize uh, civic learning goals. Indeed, if we want to bolster the foundations of our democracy, the problem isn't young people's apathy. Collectively, it's our own. Thank you.
Please welcome Tiffany Hsu of the New York Times, moderating a discussion on information literacy, how disinformation, including AI, impacts civic learning and what we can do. Okay, thank you all for being here. Um, let's just start off by having all of these fabulous panelists quickly introduce themselves. Sean, why don't you start? Good morning, everyone. Sean Huey, I work at iCivics, and I'm our Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy. Hi, everyone. I'm Vivian Shepard Mayen. I'm a student at Stanford University studying public policy. Good morning. I'm Erin Texera. I'm a Senior Editor at Frontline, PBS Frontline, and I run our local journalism initiative. Good morning. I'm Sam Weinberg. I was, until December 31st, a professor at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. And on January 1st, I am the co-principal of a new organization called Digital Inquiry Group. So all these people here are much, much smarter than I am. So let's move as quickly as we can to your expertise. But, but first, why don't we try to orient ourselves? Let's, let's establish how, in the past 250 years, our democratic republic has evolved through many, many cycles of technological change the way we citizens have um, received and processed information is vastly different than it was in the 80s and the 50s and the 20s, you, you get it. I mean, the fact that TikTok um, has made such a stir that it's being uh, voted on in the House today is, is very telling. Um, so why don't we kick off with a flash round. Talk about a technological innovation that has shaped the way we see our public institutions and processes currently. Um, let's start with Sam. Well, I think you, I think you just started, uh, uh, particularly if we're talking about how our students are learning about the world. They're scrolling through their phone and their browsers of choice, I'm sorry Google, I'm sorry Bing, are TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. Fundamental, fundament, fundamentally different way of learning about the world. What's, what's stunning to me is to see the ways that the students, young people, exchange. They are their own news feeds. There's this constant, there's no friction between, uh, between them anymore, and so they're constantly feeding each other news and from TikTok, from YouTube. But they are also uh, their own sort of uh, Associated Press Newswire, if you will. <laughs> yeah, we were kind of talking about this earlier. I I think that what's really unique now is like our ability to kind of construct what we want to see, like algorithms feed into what we're the most interested in, which is sometimes good for us because if we're interested in a specific topic, it'll be given to us a lot more, but also it kind of makes our own bubble of information, whereas maybe prior people would wake up in the morning and cable or the news channel would decide what they would see and what they would learn about, and now we create our own little worlds based on what we interact with, what we're sharing with people, and what we like and want to see on our page. Yeah, I'd say similarly, just our, our news diet has evolved. Uh, there are just so many more options. Used to be the morning paper was delivered on your doorstep. I know we can still do that, but most of us don't, right? Uh, and, and so we, we collectively build a much different diet, and uh, Sam's research has shown the way we encounter that information digital is so much different uh, than we did in an analog fashion. Great, so basically everything you're saying has my industry quaking in its collective boots. So, Sean, would you, would you say that we're currently in a digital democracy? And if so, what exactly does that mean? I would say we are, uh, particularly if, if uh, the essence of a democracy are these debates about the issues of the day mm -hmm. and uh, the modern public forum uh, is the internet, right? So these debates occur there. Um, they happen on social media. Uh, as I said, the, the, the news and information that we access uh, is available there. Um, so increasingly, yes, uh, and I would suggest not just our democracy, but any debate uh, that's happening across disciplines is happening uh, in that sphere. And is that something that excites you or scares you? 
I think there's, I get to I come, come at this the same way I did with my, my first answer. Um, I think it's the best of times and the worst of times and that we have access to unprecedented amounts of information, information that we used to have to travel to libraries, right, to access. Uh, they're, they're available in our pockets at this point in time. But then uh, the, that quantity doesn't equate with quality. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's critical that we develop a skill set to, to navigate that information uh, because that trusted source, that newspaper that dropped on your doorstep, that, that's not the way we're accessing that information. So it's very scary. Right, right. Well, thank you for referring to newspapers as a trusted source. That's <laughs> very uh, comforting. Um, so I feel like we've already said the term TikTok repeatedly in this conversation. I feel like I dream about it all the time. I heard about it on the plane um, on the way here. And it, it had me thinking a little bit about mediums, right? And Vivian, Aaron, you both have firsthand experience um, with the importance of how we get our information delivered to us, right? And how that affects how we're going to digest it. So. Talk a little bit about your understanding of the current information ecosystem and, and how that affects public discourse and the way politics plays out. Oh, wow. That's an <laughs> easy one. Right. Um, giving you softballs. You know, it's, 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 I think it's, a, it's worth uh, detailing a little bit about how Frontline has, has managed this. It's a traditional 40-year-old documentary series um, broadcast, obviously, for many, many years. And about 10 years ago, we looked up and said, we've got to find another way to get this information. And so the delivery system was going to have to change. And it was a, a revolution, really, for what we do. And as we, we've seen over the years, um, our broadcast uh, numbers have stayed strong, not as strong, um, not, not growing as much as we'd like and as much as it should. But what's grown is our YouTube uh, viewing. and. Um, that's the, that's the future of, of Frontline. Um, we have 30 minutes, 60 minute, 90 minute documentaries, some, sometimes longer. But um, we also have very, very short docs. We're pioneering um, an eight, seven, eight, nine minute uh, series for young viewers. So I think it's um, the, 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 the delivery mechanisms have to shift. The content, the trust, the information, the vetting, that never changes, mm -hmm. but we are nimble, we're trying to be nimble and figuring out where our audiences are and how we can reach them um, best we can. Vivian. Yeah, I think within that ecosystem, a lot of what we talk about is like polarization. And I think that probably leads to us getting a lot of our information from short form algorithms that feed us what we wanna hear about. But I think one of the positive things that I think is happening in the ecosystem today is that smaller creators, people who are maybe existing in those social problems that we're learning about, whether that be like international wars or even locally, are able to speak about their personal experience in a less formal way. And I think that speaks to younger people more because I'm able to see what is your life like at that moment and how do these policies impact you. And I think in that way, it does engage young people a lot more because we feel connected to what people are talking about and we're able to be more empathetic to their experience in a way that maybe a newspaper wouldn't be able to translate. Okay, so this this idea of connection is really interesting to me because w one of the parts of my job that I personally hate the most is that I have to think of any number of synonyms for the word fractured, right? Because we're always talking about the fragmented ecosystem, the fractured ecosystem, the divided ecosystem, and how there are so many different avenues to receive information. So can, can any of you talk um, about how it's possible to form connection across so many different sources and, and whether or not creating a cohesive line of information is really something that we want or need at this moment? Anyone can jump in. say this is it's, it's it's back to back to frontline and YouTube um, we are very very mindful of our comment section mm -hmm. and there's a lot of um, um, we've we've identified some super users some people who comment on every single documentary where it's an interactive um, uh, way for us to to receive information and to share and it's a little bit of a back and forth um, and I think that's an innovation for us that's, you know, we're, that's our audience and we want to be where they are. They're obviously coming to us, 
um, it's a little it's a little bit twist on your question, but I think it's 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 for, again for a 40 year old very traditional media outlet, that's um, that's a new and exciting opportunity for us. Yeah, the the comment section is right. a sore spot for me personally because I get called many affectionate names in the comments of well, my stories. <laughs> Um, but then again, I, I write about um, misinformation and disinformation. I, I, you know, I cover liars for a living. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, conspiracy theories, rumors, lies, it, they have poisoned our public discourse for as long as there's been a public square, really. But it, it feels like recently that's all come to the forefront a little more. Um, so just, we're, just so we're all on the main page here, Sam, can you explain these concepts of misinformation and disinformation, what distinguishes them, why they're important. How long do we have? <laughs> hours and hours. Um, well, just again, uh, a, a very quick way that many people use to distinguish between the two. Misinformation could be um, someone uh, making a post about ivermectin who really doesn't know what they're talking about. They might, they might have a great deal of goodwill because a cousin has sent them something and then they forward it to friends. And clearly it is not based on fact, but we don't have to impute a kind of ill will to that act. Disinformation, well, we've been talking about TikTok and we've been talking about uh, the role of the Chinese government in determining what the algorithm serves. There is very clear evidence that there are foreign powers that want to influence public opinion in this country by purposely uh, disseminating information that they know is spurious. So one of the ways that we can think about it is, is what is the intent behind the message? Got it, got it. I, I hope someone out here is keeping a count on how many times TikTok is mentioned um, in this discussion. But Sean, tell me a little bit about what is often seen as the antidote for what Sam is talking about, and that's information literacy, right? What is information literacy? Um, how is it being executed? Um, and are we in a good place with it in our democracy at the moment? That's funny you should ask. Uh, <laughs> so, so I uh, looked, uh, my, my trusted friends at the American Library Association uh, defined it. Uh, and and they, they said knowing how to find, evaluate, and use information effectively to solve a particular problem uh, or make a decision. Um, so I think that's a, a pretty simple definition. Uh, in execution, I, I think probably not so much. And this, this panel is all about the intersection of information literacy and civic learning. Um, I, I think they, they go hand in hand. Um, and I point and uh, be good for Sam to expound upon this because I'm cribbing off of his research a little bit. Um, we, we conflate young people's comfort with digital, digital devices and their ability to assess the veracity of the information they're encountering on them, right? And then uh, we, we do that as educators, right, as, as civic educators. Uh, and as educators, we're not all that adept at it ourselves, uh, and particularly how do we teach uh, these skills to young people. So it's, it, it's absolutely critical, um, but we know across generations that we don't do this well, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll leave it to Sam to talk about how to actually do it, because he's got, got a method uh, to that madness. Yes, let's hear it. Um, I, I feel like in, in my reporting, your name comes up constantly as like the go-to guru for information literacy research, right? So, so what do your findings tell us about what works and what doesn't? I'll begin only by disabusing the word guru from my, <laughs> my, I'm a researcher and the definition of research is that you don't know the answer before you start. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I'm not a soothsayer and I don't have all the answers. But again, I think that we need to kind of take stock. We can't blame young people for not knowing something that they've never been taught. And so the rapidity of the way that this technology has come to our backs has been so quick that it's caught all of us unaware. We're using something called Google or Bing or Edge now, and, but no one's really given us any instructions on how to do this. So we're really, we're driving blind. We, we don't know the internet's equivalent of uh, crossing over a double yellow line. It's not taught, 
And, and if anything, many schools and many teachers feel like, wait a second, it's not my responsibility. I don't know what, I don't know what to do. The, I'm a biology teacher. I'm teaching science. Well, your students, the minute they get out of biology class, are on their phone learning that baking soda is an antidote to cancer. So again, these are things that deeply implicate all, all of the topics that we teach in school. And we're just starting to get an awareness that when we want to learn about the orders of the day, whether it is uh, a charter schools or the efficacy of a soda tax, we're not going to the public library and pulling a book off the shelf. We're scrolling through our phones or opening up our laptop. And that's where the educational, particularly when we think about civic understanding, that's where the educational emphasis needs to go. Okay. Resident young person on the panel, what do you think of this? <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of the discourse online is about like older people blaming us for not knowing right from wrong. <laughs> um, and I think that sometimes in many ways, like having access to the internet and constantly hearing about misinformation, um, we do look for like other sources. And I think in many ways, as I was referencing earlier, we get to hear a lot more perspectives that wouldn't typically be maybe shown in like mainstream media, like a news channel. Um, and I think getting to hear from other young people is always really helpful in that like literacy aspect because we're able to understand each other and we have the same experience of being introduced to the internet at such a young age. Um, but I think that like our teachers engaging in that, they also, like you said, didn't know this was gonna happen either and kind of being in the public school system as internet was beginning to be a thing and research was like no longer in books and I was researching online, like definitely had some not good sources come out um, and no classes were ever introduced to me to teach me like how do you find a good source? It was more, you know, over time I developed that skill set, but I think that, yeah, there should be some sort of accountability of like teaching students from the beginning what good research looks like and what good interaction with online information looks like. There's a reason you got to Stanford. I know. But don't you think, don't you think that, that the adults teaching also sometimes don't know the, the difference yeah. between good information? And I think it's, it starts downstream or upstream, however you want to think of it. Like, you know, the, how many um, adults in our lives it's, will text us something that, oh my gosh, did you see this? Well, is it true? How do you yeah, know yeah. it's true? You know, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and the egg thing. Si Two-sided yeah. coin, yeah, because we also have like, I know sometimes my mom will send me stuff from Facebook and, and stuff, and I think even in some ways, like younger people have better literacy online because we are able to read past maybe something that doesn't look super legit because we're always on the internet. So I think there's maybe something to learn from both sides from each other. Yeah, I think, I think if more of us knew to listen to thoughtful rising leaders like you as opposed to crazy Uncle Bob at the Thanksgiving yeah. table, we'd probably <laughs> not be having this conversation. Um, but I, I, I think it's time to pivot and face the boogeyman um, that has thrown a wrench into everything we've been talking about, and that's artificial intelligence, which is what everyone's been waiting for. Um, I, I think we all here on stage understand the um, really deep dangers that this fast advancing technology could pose, right? We've got deep fake campaign videos, we've got um, robocalls based on cloned audio. There's you know, the threat of an October surprise that um, is based on synthetic content that we can't debunk in time. Um, so it, it, it's all terrifying, frankly, but it's also really promising. So Aaron, Sean, tell us a little bit about how we can harness this really powerful tech to benefit civic learning. Sean, you're closest to sure. me. Sure. So, so I think about this much more from a policy perspective, given the, the, uh, where I sit. And as you know, Tiffany, there's tremendous energy around this in, in policy circles um, in Congress and actually bipartisan conversations that we've been engaged in around this. And at the state level, last I checked, there's over 407 AI-related bills. Uh, in state legislatures, uh, and most of them are focused on those topics like bias, disinformation, racial recognition, deep fakes. Um, Department of Education has put out guidance on this. Uh, 
talks about the upsides of artificial intelligence, right? The ability, for example, to differentiate learning, to uh, provide tutoring to students who've fallen behind uh, in the pandemic. Um, I think they're light on some of the challenges we've discussed here, uh, the threats to democracy, its intersection with civic learning and how we need to build that in. Um, so the conversations we've been having, particularly on Capitol Hill, uh, center on preparing teachers for this, making sure they have the resources for high quality professional development, uh, making sure they have access uh, to curriculum and materials uh, to do this. Um, states, as they take this on, uh, often have it in their standards. By our count, uh, 19 states have policies related to information literacy. Um, 37 have information literacy baked into their standards. Uh, but they're often scattered. They're not taking kind of a concerted approach to this issue. So we recommend that. Um, and once again, pointing to, to, to Sam, uh, it's important that we research um, what works, right? Because this, this is uh, very new. Uh, and and uh, Sam and his work at Stanford have showed that, shown that just uh, a modest number of interventions can actually move the needle on this. Uh, but we need to know much more about what works. And those pieces should all be integrated. So the training of teachers, access to high quality curriculum and materials, and uh, research and evaluation on what works. So we recommend uh, that Congress, uh, particularly as it intervenes in this issue area, that it, it, it think about uh, artificial intelligence. And there's, uh, just to give you one example, there's a bipartisan bill in the House uh, called the AI Literacy Act. And it would do just that. It would bring uh, money. There's a, a digital equity fund would bring money specifically uh, to AI literacy, uh, to states, to nonprofits that work in this space. Yeah, I have to say as a journalist, I'm not easily surprised, but I am, I've been shocked in the past few months at how quickly lawmakers have moved to address AI. It's like there, there are a number of things you should be focusing on, but they're like, let's, let's deal with AI. Um, so that's fascinating. And Aaron. Some, and some oh, interesting yeah. bedfellows too, right? That, that uh, at the national level, you'd be surprised. Oh, tell us more. So no, just some of the, some of the you know, very partisan actors mm -hmm. that are uh, engaged in working across the aisle on this issue. So it speaks to its prominence. Right, right. Aaron. You know as well as I do that, that we're in news organizations grappling on the ground it's like playing in, in mud. It's, it's really, it's very, very challenging. We have to go back to the bedrock principles of, of fact checking. How do we know what we think we know? Where does this picture come from? Uh, digging deep into um, you know, what's in the background of the image, what time of day, what do the shadows look like? I mean, getting into the granular thing with, with photographs. Um, I think uh, we, when we see it in the news, in the headlines in the last several days with, with Kensington Palace and a photograph that, is, that is, uh, was put out um, and, and turned out not to be quite, uh, it, was un, it was doctored. Um, so I think it's, it's again, the bedro bedrock principles of fact checking, um, double, how, do you, how do you know what you think you know, and going, just taking more and more time more and more resources into uh, pausing, checking, double checking, um, because really all we have is trust, <laughs> the trust of our audiences, and, um, and nothing is more important as journalists, as you know, so, um, so yes, it's, it's, I will say AI is a tool, right? It's like spell check, it could be, uh, or Wikipedia, but it, it can never be the end <laughs> of the process. Maybe it's the beginning, if that's where you want to start, but I, it, as a journalist, it, it is, is truly um, sort of on the sidelines. Uh, let's be responsible with it, let's be careful, um, and let's watch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you're talking about trust, but public trust at the moment is not great, um, and you know, a lot of the technologies that we have on hand aren't helping too much um, with that. I mean, not too long ago, I was asking a deep fake detection service to evaluate an image of a 20 foot tall Neanderthal. And the service was like, yep, that's definitely a real photo taken from a camera. Um, so, Sam, I, I'm pleading with you to please, please, please give me hope, make me feel better. How do we, teach students and really all of us to navigate this kind of environment? I thought I heard from the beginning that hope was a word you're not supposed to say. <laughs> um, listen, 
I think that, that there's a lot, of thing, a lot of things that we can do. And there are modest things we, that we can do, and there are full-blown, full-bore efforts that we can take on. But I'm an ameliorist, and I believe that modest efforts can have big effects. So just to, to give you a few examples, uh, we did a, a randomized control treatment study in Lincoln, Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska Public Schools, where in six hours of instruction, which is less than the amount of time the average American adolescent spends online a day, in six hours of instruction, students nearly doubled their ability to make wise choices when faced with conflicting digital information. So and, uh, at a study that we did at the University of North Texas in a nutrition class, we were asked by nutrition faculty, folks, we need help. Our students are coming in with the wackiest ideas about public health. Um, about 3% of the students, when given a website that was really, really fishy, um, stayed on that website and completely went down a rabbit hole. Uh, after one asynchronous 10-week course, that went up to 77% that they were able to get off and find information. So the, we, we need to start to teach these things. They are teachable. We can indeed move the needle. But this cannot be a patch on the bottom of the curriculum. This can't be something that we, a barnacle, that is put either on the college or the high school curriculum. This has to be infused in every place where it has implications, in history, in civics, in biology, in mathematics. Only then will we transform the curriculum in ways that match the needs of a digital society. Now, Vivian, you're probably, as a student, living this more than any of us. So. What do you think works for civic learning in the classroom and outside? Yeah, I, I think moving civic, lear civic learning away from like a topic that's, I guess, like private, like, oh, like that's something you do based on what you're interested in. I know at my school we have like Democracy Day, we get the entire day off, and it's dedicated to different um, speakers, events, there's like even food vendors and stuff, but we get the school day off and it's like dedicated to that's what we're going to be doing as a community. This is like an important day and it's it's not just every four-year election, it's every year. So every election that comes up, we get the day of school off. There's people from all political parties available to speak on campus. There's clubs that meet that are nonpartisan, and I think making it more like community-based makes things kind of move in a more positive way because it's not just me walking into a classroom and hearing another lecture about you know how important voting or how important what where i get my information is from but instead like interacting with those people meeting journalists meeting other experts in this field and and realizing like how i am being impacted on and how i can kind of change the way that that goes on to the future um, that to me has been, I think, the most effective. I know at Stanford before Democracy Day, it was like one in five students were voting, even in the four-year elections. Um, and it's, it's flipped upside down since the establishment of Democracy Day. And it's completely student-led, just funding from the school, but like students decide what they want to hear about. And I think you'd be surprised like how diverse their interests are, um, despite this kind of like, I guess, monoculture online of what we hear about. Um, and outside of the classroom, I think similarly, it's, it's giving grants, it's allowing students to do research and things that they're interested in, and letting them kind of interact with the topics they hear about in real life. I think sometimes we become so far away from them because we see them online, we read about them in maybe textbooks, but you know, going out and like, for example, me being here and seeing what this looks like and seeing what's going on with policymakers in real life, like shows the other side of, of what is being discussed online. So now I'm not just watching a 30 second video on a policy, I'm seeing the people who are doing the research behind the construction of that policy and then advocating for it in government. Yeah, context bounds, mm -hmm. incredibly important, which is something that Aaron knows as an investigative journalist. So talk a little bit about um, you know, how, you, how you ensure media hygiene. Um, in your work, and, and how does that translate to civic learning, right? How, how can we all responsibly inform and stay informed? Mm -hmm. One of the things we said echoes what Sam said. Um, we we uh, start every investigation thinking about what our assumptions are and then reporting against them. 
mapping out a plan? How do you report against what you assume to be the case? Um, and then it's step by step by step, checking yourself, working as a team to, uh, to poke holes in what your colleagues and uh, your sources are saying. Um, and and it's, a, it's a, an iterative process, but it's, it's, it's very traditional. It's just what journalists have always hopefully done. Um, and we feel more strongly than ever that that tradition and that um, uh, being, being incredibly ruthlessly fair to all sides is the only thing that's going to um, save us. <laughs> um, and that truth matters more than ever and that we are, um, could be a bulwark against, against uh, the erosion of truth as, as journalists. Um, and then we're, we're, uh, we at Frontline are extremely um, grateful to be part of the larger um, PBS public media ecosystem where the values of all of that are permeate everything we do um, and with an educational component. So uh, PBS learning and, and all the educational work that we do. So we bring all of our journalism into all the different um, aspects and hopefully reaching students uh, and their parents. So. Great. so to wrap up, we're just gonna go down the line and offer one piece of advice to all of these people here, anyone who's interested in information literacy, which really should be everyone. What should we be doing to ensure that civic learning is happening in an effective way now? And praying and hoping that it all ends up okay is not an acceptable answer. Sean? Well, I think it speaks to the urgency of this work. I was just yesterday reviewing a, a literacy study that demonstrated the more time we spent on social studies in early grades, the better it improves students' reading performance, right? And I think that does translate in a digital domain. Uh, content knowledge is key, like leading with content particularly as information is further separated from its source, which artificial intelligence, of course, does. So uh, leading with content, uh, engaging content, uh, to me, is key in a through line with this. Right, Vivian? <coughs> I think I'm a little biased, but um, I think like meeting young people where they're at, at least from that perspective, is like recognizing their, you know, the world that we were born into, and then again, like the knowledge and power that they do have. Um, they're able to create really big communities that are impactful and strong. So I think reinforcing that in ways that lead to positive discussion, discourse, that encourages people to want to learn more information on their own is really important. Um, instead of kind of making the internet a big scary thing that's full of bad information. Echo that. Meeting people where they are and um, being ever more mindful of the fact that, that what's happening today has long roots in history and, and it ties in with, with civic education. And so what's in the news, what's in the headlines, we've likely done a documentary about it or there's likely some incredible uh, print journalism or radio journalism out there to help explain. And so pulling all that together into civics education, I think it's, it's immediate. And, it, and I think students see headlines and then they, they, they see their lives and they see history class. And if we can integrate that and meet students where they are, the more the better. When we talk about interventions and curriculum, the, a question that I'm often asked is, should we begin at fifth grade? Should we begin at seventh grade? Should we start at high? Should we wait till the university? And my response is, wrong question. Mm -hmm. That curricula are not for students. Curricula are for the adults that implement those curricula. And if the adults don't feel efficacious, you can have the shiniest, most glittery curriculum in the world, and it will stay on a shelf. So we need to invest in professional development for the adults that teach in our schools and universities so that they feel effective in being able to convey this curriculum to students. Um, my piece of advice to everyone here is to keep listening to these people. And that's all. Thank you so much. And now, a research talk led by Ashley Wu of the RAND Corporation.
All right, there we go. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, so nearly three years ago, states began enacting limitations on the topics teachers could address in the classroom. Early limitations focused on critical race theory and divisive concepts related to race or gender, and now are increasingly focused on gender identity and sexual orientation, although our work suggests that teachers are broadly interpreting them to include other political and social issues too. Today, 20 states have passed such a limitation, affecting about 1.3 million teachers and 20 million students. My colleagues and I at RAND have been studying the impact of these limitations on teachers' instruction. But what we didn't yet know was how teachers felt these limitations were impacting student learning. And so today, I'm going to be presenting our brand new research findings on how these limitations may be impacting teachers' ability to foster important civic skills and dispositions in students. So in spring 2023, we surveyed a nationally representative sample of over 8,000 public school teachers. And we asked teachers whether they felt limitations on race or gender-related topics were negative, neutral, or positive for student learning. And we found that very few teachers, only 3% nationally, believe that limitations positively impact student learning, while about 10 times as many teachers felt that limitations negatively impact student learning. And the remainder of teachers either felt neutral or weren't aware of limitations. And even in states with restrictions and states as different as California and Florida, very few teachers believe that limitations are positive for student learning. And in open-ended responses, teachers told us why. Many teachers told us that, te uh, that limitations constrain students' access to knowledge by reducing the availability of facts and perspectives, making it harder for students to develop a complete understanding of history. As this one teacher in a state with a restriction said, if I followed the state law to the letter of the law, I couldn't teach basic history. Teachers also contended that limitations rendered open discourse more difficult. Students had fewer opportunities to ask authentic questions and reflect honestly on their opinions. And as this teacher said, it unnecessarily makes the learning environment more difficult and hostile to an open exchange of ideas. And all of this makes it harder for students to develop, to develop critical thinking skills like evaluating information and making informed judgments. Teachers also talked about how limitations influence the way that students might think about themselves and others. Limiting discussions of race and gender could signal to students, and especially students of color and students who identify as LGBTQ, that they're unwelcome or that they don't matter. And meanwhile, limitations could reduce students' capacity to develop empathy and tolerance for people different than themselves. This one teacher said, limiting students from diversity is counterproductive to helping them develop into empathetic and understanding members of the community. Teachers worry that all of these consequences might eventually snowball into even bigger consequences, like leaving students ill prepared to navigate the world as adults, perpetuating discrimination, and constraining freedom of expression, thus impairing the pillars of a strong democracy. So these data tell us that no matter where they teach, teachers generally believe that limitations are not good for student learning. And as these policies may make it harder for teachers to help students learn about history, engage in discourse about real world issues, and understand other perspectives, teachers need guidance. So if you'd like to learn more about our research, here's the QR code that will take you to our report. And given our findings, I'll leave you all with two questions today. First, how can we help teachers develop students' civic skills and dispositions, particularly within the constraints of these limitations? In other words, how can we give teachers the tools to nurture students into knowledgeable citizens who are able to fully participate in our diverse and multicultural democracy? And second, as we think about our evolving policy landscape, how can we bring together educators, parents, communities, and policymakers to develop policies that support student civic development? Thank you all for your time today.
Please welcome Danielle Allen of Harvard University, moderating a discussion on bridging the divide, overcoming political polarization through investment in civic learning. All right. Good morning, friends. How is everybody? Have a great good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. It is terrific to see you here today. I can't believe this is only the second annual Civic Learning Week. It feels like we've been doing this forever, Louise. But no, onward, onward, and to, to this year and to next year and to many years to come of growth and engagement and success. So I have a terrific panel for you today. We are focusing on bridging the divide, overcoming political polarization through investment in civic learning. And let me just start by sharing who is here with me, and then I'll say a word about our theme. First of all, I've got Tommy Dolphin, who's an educator, middle school civics in the Boston Public Schools. Terrific to have you here, Tommy, thank you. Thank you. Secretary Amy Gadara from the Commonwealth of Virginia, Secretary of Education. Nate McAllister, Humanities Program Manager for History um, for the Kansas State Department of Education and President Lori Patton of Middlebury College. So you'll hear in this an incredible array of expertise across the sectors of education. And everybody on our panel is directly engaging with leading through the challenge of polarization. Everybody in this space knows how severe that challenge is right now. The way I like to capture it is that the, the statistics that were about families in the middle of the 20th century and concerns about interracial marriage, not wanting people to marry somebody of a different race. That no longer pertains to our world, those kinds of fears and concerns. They've been replaced by fears that your child will marry somebody of a different party. So, so party now literally has the same statistical impact on thinking about who you want your child to marry as race used to do half a century ago. That's a pretty stark indicator of where we are with regard to polarization. Now, of course, in our classrooms, on our campuses, it is always the case that we have students coming from a diversity of backgrounds seeking to learn together. That means that bridging the divide, overcoming polarization, is one of the most important jobs we have as educators right now. And on this panel, we're gonna solve the problem of how to deal with polarization. <laughs> Okay, no, not really, obviously, but everybody here has made significant progress. So what we're going to do is talk today both about how each of our panelists came to understand what the significance of polarization was, and then something they've learned as they've sought to break through. And we're gonna be a storytelling panel. I've asked everybody to share some stories from their own experience to really bring to light um, precisely what we're facing and how we can address it. So the first story I've asked everybody to share is what their aha moment was. The moment when they realized that polarization really is something serious that they had to think about in their own work. And so Tommy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, wonderful. Um, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Um, so my aha moment comes uh, from the fall of 2020. Um, of course, we were dealing with COVID and I was teaching from my basement. Um, but I started off the school year with um, a unit on John Lewis, who had just passed uh, that summer. And I was trying to engage the students, um, getting them to think about the purpose of civics, why they're learning civics, and that it's to uh, develop their sense of selves and their sense of community, um, and what they'd want to do to improve their community um, as they grow up. And I decided to take John Lewis's editorial that he had uh, published in the newspapers on the on the Davis funeral, and basically just use it as a as a reading uh, baseline. Because as at the start of the school year, I need to figure out where my students are, what's their reading levels, what's their writing levels, um, as I develop how I'm going to educate them. Uh, it's more than just content; I have to teach skills as well. And so I use his editorial and just ask some basic questions: what What's the meaning of this word used in this sentence? Who do you think his target audience is here? Um, and I actually ended up receiving some pushback from a parent who felt that given the times, the political climate of that summer, and 
COVID going on that um, it wasn't the time for her child to be learning about John Lewis and what did John Lewis really have to do with a civics education. Um, I'll take your guess as, uh, you know. So I, I wasn't sure how to deal with this, so I, I wrote quite a long response, read it several times before I replied back to the parent and just explained that the purpose of the assignment was to get the reading sample, et cetera, and, and just kind of get the kids thinking about what his message was. Um, because he, in essence, was trying to pass the torch. And um, there was just kind of a go back and forth here, and it got a little hostile, and she, she just really felt that her child didn't need to. She said they don't watch the news at home, that she lets her child know what the child needs to know. Um, and I'm trying to develop a 14-year-old child here. Um, so that's my aha moment, realizing that this person, John Lewis, who I looked up to, who I feel like most of America would look up to was somebody that was a polarizing individual. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tommy. And we'll come back to the, the pathways to solutions that you've, you've found since then. Nate, how about you? What was your aha moment? Well, like Tommy, my aha moment came in that same time period when a, a news story broke. Actually, it was broken by students at the, the school. And the namesake of the school district And naively, I assumed that this would be a moment for the community to come together and say, we need to do something about this. And what happened instead was students had to take up the mantle of leadership and push for that name change when the community at large didn't necessarily want to do anything. led by students, uh, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Nate, for sharing that. You can hear from these stories what a challenging environment for educators this moment is, right? So, and that was in the K-12 space. President Patton, what was your aha moment? You're speaking to us about college campuses. Yeah. Um, so, um, mine was a little bit earlier, not a COVID moment, but in 2017-18, when we had a series of campus protests around controversial speakers, um, around issues that had to do with uh, race and inclusivity. Um, and Middlebury is a newly inclusive, uh, if you look at the past decades, um, we uh, are way more inclusive and way more diverse than we have been for pretty much 200 years. So all of this is new. Middlebury was no longer a kind of bubble in the beautiful Vermont mountains. It never was, but um, it, it couldn't think of itself that way anymore. So we were managing a lot of this, but I remember I always tried to be present to the students, and it was a honeymoon period for basically uh, two years or a year and a half, and whenever I talk to a new college president now, and they say, oh my God, it's a honeymoon period, I'm in my second year, and I'm just like, okay, it's gonna be okay, <laughs> something's gonna happen, just hang in there. Uh, but, uh, and there's a kind of naivete that you might have noticed as a, as a theme. So during one protest when I was there, always present to the students, 
um, I, had, I had developed this idea of rhetorical resilience. And what that is, is, and as I shared with the campus and work with students around this and so on, is the idea that in your speaking, in your writing, in all of your rhetoric, you need to be resilient because the public square is the hardest place to be right now. It takes true courage in a way that previous generations, it always took courage, but not in the way that it does now. And liberal arts, I think one of the most fundamental products of a liberal arts and sciences education is courage. So all of that was going well, except that there started to be this critique, um, and there was one sign during the protest that said, bleep rhetorical resilience. Don't make me be rhetorically resilient. And I thought, wow, what's going on? Something really profound is happening here, partly because uh, the critique was you shouldn't put the burden on students of color to have to be rhetorically resilient, uh, but lots of other critiques as well. The aha moment for me was realizing that students want democracy to be concrete. And it was my job as an educator to make democracy concrete, to give them something to imagine rather than just a cool, and it wasn't, it was more than a cool principle but to give them practice and to give them imagination. And so that ended up as an aha moment um, and a, a $25 million uh, conflict transformation initiative, which an incredible donor was able to share with us, where we said, okay, conflict transformation, the tools to manage conflict is a fundamental bedrock of democracy. And it helps students imagine themselves and make democracy concrete. And that's what we've been working on for the last uh, four years. Be happy to share more. Thank you so much. We will definitely come back to that, President Patton. So Secretary Gadara, your aha moment. When did you know polarization was really what you had to deal with? Uh, so first of all, it's a delight to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers for having me. But also thank you to everyone who's here. Uh, this conversation matters so much. And just thank you for spending the day thinking about these really important topics. Uh, so I have permission to give two aha stories, I think. So I want us to do a, both a negative one and a kind of a depressing one, but as well as, which uh, should be an inspiring one in terms of what you're hearing about, we need to have these conversations. And then really uh, an inspiring one about what we can do about it. So I'll start with a negative and then go, go positive. Um, so one of the most um, uh, dispiriting days of this experience of being Secretary of Education came during a State Board of Education meeting. And we were having a conversation about our history standards and, um, and there became a debate among some of our State Board of Education folks about the, our founding documents, the Declaration and the Constitution. And it became incredibly heated in terms of using words like patriotism and exceptionalism and then became devolved into a conversation about um, are, do people have racist viewpoints if they think one way or the other interpreting the founding documents, which eventually led to one of the members of the boards not being confirmed and not serving on the State Board of Education. And to me, it was so depressing to think about our founding documents and a conversation about interpretation of those documents, um, the ultimate polarization, and also um, a tool and a weapon to be used for political purpose. And to me, what is so important about this conversation that you all are engaged in today, that we're all engaged in today and hopefully every day, is the fact that if one party claims that it owns the, the civics debate or civics becomes a political weapon or a football um, or a way to score points, this democracy in our country is done. And so it's why convenings like this matter so very much is that we continue to listen to each other and learn and that we continue to understand why civics education and civics at all ages matters. So thank you for being here. Um, so on to the positive story. So how many of you have been to a naturalization ceremony? Okay, awesome. That's good. So that was one of the most positive days of my experience in this wonderful role as Secretary of Education in Virginia. Um, there is an incredible judge, Judge Novak, uh, who has taken it upon as part of his role as a public servant to take naturalization ceremonies into communities and take them especially into our higher education institutions. And he has started by going to each of our four HBCUs and then working with the communities in which the HBCUs are by inviting students to be part of this. But one of the most wonderful educational pieces is bringing in fourth grade and eighth grade classrooms and having breakfast with them and having his law clerks go through what they're going to experience at the naturalization ceremony, walk through the citizenship, citizenship test, um, and make it a fun morning of learning and experience 
and helping them also reflect on what an, an unbelievable privilege it is to be born into this country and citizenship and the fact that people are willing to leave everything and to listen to that vow that you are going to only uh, have allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and what that means. Um, and that is probably the most inspiring piece and for me in terms of polarization, it's not just political polarization, but it's also how far apart some of our communities are in terms of knowledge and understanding of our, of our democracy and what a complete privilege it is to be born into um, our democracy and how do we also make sure that every single person in Virginia and I hope in the country understands why it matters to understand civics and be actively involved. Thank you. We definitely need inspiration when we're, we're tackling these hard subjects, so I appreciate that. Um, Tommy, I'm going to come back to you to talk about Pathways of Success, and I know you have a story in mind to tell. If you don't mind, before you tell that, I would love if you could also just finish your first story. How, how did you end up coming to an accommodation with the parent? How did that unfold? And then your, your other story about success would be great. Sure. Um, so it... The student in question um, is also a student um, with autism. Uh, I teach at the Henderson Inclusion School um, in Dorchester, and we were the first full inclusion school, um, K to 12 school. Um, and so this is our kind of our bread and butter, is how do we help students with disabilities learn? And the last thing we want to do, regardless of whether it's COVID or, or not, is put any sort of like undue pressure or um, fatigue on students. And so the student in question was having a hard time at home. Um, the, there's certain words that were like kind of triggering emotional outbursts um, for her. Um, and I spoke with my administrator and he and I kind of went back and forth and then I, I reached out to mom and we came to an agreement um, that given uh, disability, given uh, COVID, and that this student was learning partially at home and sometimes in person at the school, um, that what we would do is go ahead and if there were any sort of questions that were difficult for her to um, respond to, she could just, instead of leaving it blank, you know, uh, just write quickly a little sentence for me so that way I knew um, that this was a particular topic for her or she could skip an assignment if the whole assignment wasn't, we could create makeup assignments that were more kind of like geared towards interests for her. I just think that's such a powerful story because it reveals the complexity that every learner brings into the classroom and that families bring into the classroom. And sometimes we don't even know the whole of what's behind a strong reaction to something. And so I think it's important when we think about polarization to recognize that it's not always just about ideology, right? That there can be many other strands that affect whether or not people are ready to tackle hard subjects. So again, it speaks to how important our careful, thoughtful educators are in the classroom and all the additional work that goes into success in teaching in addition to what's actually on the page. So thank you, Tommy, for, for sharing that. Um, you have other successes as well, so we'd love to have you also share um, your other story. Sure, so the success story, so when I uh, was contacted about this panel, I freaked out because I was like, oh God, I teach eighth grade civics, what am I doing? And Mr. Dolphin's civics class is not like bringing anybody together, like we're not solving immigration or doing anything like that. Um, but I really had to kind of think about it. And I've been a history teacher in Boston for 13 years and I've taught high school, I've taught all the levels of middle school, and I am absolutely in love with civics, teaching civics to eighth graders. And the reason for that is because it's alive. It's always happening. There's always something, an election, there's always something happening. Um, and there's these societal moments. And unfortunately, my story is also grounded in, in really tragic events, and that is we typically have these mass shootings or school shootings. And um, it's something that my students need to learn more about. They want to learn more about. They ask me to teach them about. And so um, when things of this nature happen, I provide resources for them, uh, newspaper links, news sites, and I give them an opportunity to kind of explore what do we know. I give them opportunity to, to be with that material, and then we have a conversation. What did you learn? What did we know so far? Um, and then from there, we move into the, how are you feeling? So we might do 
a restorative justice circle, or just kind of have a free-flowing conversation. But I try to give as much airtime to the students as possible. Um, they don't need to hear me um, speak, and it's more for them. And so we'll be in a circle, and it might just be, how's everybody doing? And just kind of go from there and see what the conversation brings up. Um, and if it starts to drag a little bit, I might throw in a, a question. I might try to, I'll try to bring it back to civics. I've taught you folks about the Bill of Rights. I've taught you about the Second Amendment. What do you, what do you folks think about that? And should we change it? Should we do something with it? And then try to have a civic conversation that way. And oftentimes, it'll turn into my students wanting to talk about how much they would like to have a weapon, that they can't wait to be an adult so that they can have a weapon because they live um, in an urban setting where uh, they're afraid. Uh, they've lost family members to gun violence or other acts of violence. I myself have lost student to gun violence. Um, and it gets kind of dark sometimes, but y you leave it open to the kids. And so you'll have these conversations where the students will be on one end of the spectrum that way. I can't wait to have a gun. I think everybody should have a gun. Um, and then we have students on the other side who are saying, no one should have a gun. And so the conversation will kind of be anchored like that until myself, if it, if it doesn't seem like it's budging, or other students say, well, we have the Second Amendment, so people should be able to have guns, but maybe there are certain people that shouldn't have a gun, or there are certain types of guns that shouldn't be available, or there should be limitations. So it's, we end up with this conversation where we're at these two polar ends, and slowly the kids are kind of coming towards a middle ground. Um, and... <laughs> That's kind of what the goal is, is to have conversations. As the secretary mentioned, is we have to have these conversations. We have to provide airtime for students to have these conversations. They can't just sit with their beliefs and never hear anything else. Um, we heard about a bubble earlier in the other panel, so. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I think you could all see in the elegance and graciousness with which Tommy described his classroom, you know, what he brings to teaching. And you gave us a very beautiful portrait of how important it is that there be a foundation of learning, of knowledge, you know, sort of what do we know, what do we know so far, and so forth, but that there also be space to engage with feeling so head and heart together, and then your point about making space for a conversation where people can learn from each other, it's just really central to this work of bridging divides. I mean, that's a beautiful example of how civics can help us um, overcome the divides. Many lessons to be learned here. Nate, um, how about your um, lessons of success or your story of success? Well, um... I, I want to talk about what is going on across the state of Kansas. And it's not just since I've come to the State Department, but it's something that's been building within our state for some time, and our educators, our teachers, really do lead that process. And that has been a model of a state assessment that is inquiry-based. I know we had Sam Weinberg on here, and the inquiry design model that uh, he is so apt to to highlight. And one of the things that we've done, and Tommy was mentioning that the kids are out doing these things, that civics is everywhere, it's pervasive. And giving students the opportunity to create a state assessment that is also personal, that is also community-based. And through that, they are able to not only lead, but then and sometimes make change in their community. So we have um, a civics walkabout that a couple of teachers created in Kansas, where the students go out in their community and the students are given the task, questions, compelling questions, about if you were 90 years old or if you were disabled, does this community serve you? And if it doesn't, where can we make changes? Where can we make the positive change? And that, in turn, becomes an avenue for the students to positively affect that change by going to their city council, their, com their county commission, to say we need these changes and this is why we need these changes. And that in turn can be their state assessment. So we've turned this whole inquiry process into something that they, students don't merely sit down and do one day. It becomes something that becomes a part of their everyday success in the classroom. And we have, a, and I've got this little pin on my lapel, uh, Kansans can, and it's more than just a little catchy phrase. Um, it, yeah, 
It actually, it, it, the CAN is Civic Advocacy Network. We've created an entire network of students talking to one another to work with one another to affect change in Kansas. And they have an entire civic engagement conference, all student-led, all student projects that are highlighted across the state of Kansas. And those, those are the successes that I, I think are important for us to continue with as we move forward. Terrific, I think that was a really beautiful example of President Patton's point about making democracy concrete, right? They like that civics walkabout. That's a very concrete uh, you know, element of doing democracy. So thank you for that example. Um, President Patton, your story of success. Yeah, um, I was about to say the exact same thing about Nathan's example. Um, I think as educators, those of us who are educators in the room, or anyone who belongs to an institution, I think there's always a moment when the institution has to fundamentally stop and say, what are we about? And that was that year for us. So we realized as faculty, we said we need to listen differently. Um, we can't just teach, we have to listen. So we started on something called the Engage Listening Project in which we trained our faculty. We started with faculty to listen better and to develop the dialogical skills to promote diversity of viewpoint in the classroom. Now, a lot of professors are like, oh, I already know how to do this. But we said, do you? Is it working? And because we had this institutional moment. And so they, folks who are part of this, and now we have um, more than 2 thirds of our professoriate has been through this engaged listening project, has really shifted their views about how to promote diversity of viewpoint in the classroom. Uh, we then moved into this grant, which is basically the idea that if it needs to be something, a democracy needs to be at stake for students. They've come to Middlebury to do a liberal arts and sciences education. So if we understand conflict as a liberal art, that means that they will encounter conflict transformation framing in every part of the curriculum. So that's undergrad, that's preparation for high school teachers in our Breadloaf School of English, that's experiential learning and internships, that's our global schools abroad. They all have an opportunity to do an internship in looking at the traditions of conflict transformation in that country and also at the graduate level. Um, and what we have found, first of all, John Paul Lederach's idea of conflict transformation is you study conflict to make structural change in addition to resolving the specific conflict that is confronting you. Um, it sounds very straightforward, but he has such incredible experience in Venezuela and Nepal and so on in rebuilding governments. It's the study of the change that adds the liberal arts component. So we've, uh, this is now our third year of the project and it's scary because you're, it's everywhere now and it's all about practice as well as study together. It can't be one or the other. And I would say there were th three very short moments that have just filled me with joy to watch. Um, the first is all of our interns, whatever they do, um, wherever they go out in the summer, they have training in conflict transformation framing. So it makes it concrete right away. They do a, a work walkabout in a way. And one of them was in the uh, Vermont Center for Restorative Justice. And she wrote a blog about her experience. And she said, I had to work on restorative justice with this guy. He did such damage to our community in Addison County. It was awful. I, I really disliked this guy. I disliked him at the end. But because we had to stay in relationship, I have to admit that I have a relationship with him now. And I thought, bingo, that's what it is. You maintain that relationship, even through the dislike and the difference. Um, second is a story of uh, Addison County Housing for Hab Habitat for Humanity house that was going up in a neighborhood. All the neighborhoods protested to it. But asking students to study conflict in a particular way ubiquitously across our curriculum, we asked them to focus on when is the rhetorical moment when people change minds. There was a huge neighborhood protest. We don't want this house here. And one woman at the town hall meeting got up and said, you know, all of you are teachers uh, or uh, workers of some kind or other. And my house was one of the first built in this neighborhood. And I was a nurse. And if I hadn't had help building this house, I wouldn't be your neighbor now. And suddenly the discourse changed in the town hall meeting. And you could see our students who were all interns in this, their eyes 
grow open and people shifted the conversation and barely went through. There was still hostility, let's get real, but it was something shifted. And then the final thing is um, just recently, students uh, thinking about Israel, Gaza, all the stuff that is um, really creating havoc on our campuses and our students decided, the Hillel students decided they would bake bread, challah, for Shabbat and sell it. And the Muslim Students Association bought it. And then everyone was buying, Muslims and, and Jews were buying uh, challah, and this was in early uh, November, and they donated it to uh, an NGO, uh, World Central Kitchen, that is working in both Israel and Gaza. And they got so excited that in Purim, the Jewish holiday of Purim, they will be baking hamantaschen, which is a traditional um, Jewish delight, uh, delicacy, um, and selling it. So it's now become a thing. Um, food is an amazing way to bring people together, but it helped them conceptualize it internationally. So there was the personal level of that one student in restorative justice. There was a collective level of the Habitat for Humanity switch in the town meeting. Uh, and there was our students now actively thinking about how they can behave differently and concretely on behalf of democratic citizenship globally. Great, terrific. Thank you so much, President Patton. Um, Secretary Guderra, your turn. Success. Tell us what you figured out about how, how to break through polarization and, and get things done. Great. I'm going to share two, one in K-12 and one in higher education, both part of my secretariat. So in K-12, uh, many of you probably have heard that we updated our history and civic standards in the last couple of years. It kind of got some attention. Uh, and it got attention for being um, full of conflict and people had, were passionate and all that. And I would argue we just embodied in Virginia what democracy looks like. It's messy, people are passionate, uh, people have differing views and ideas, but we ended up with a really great end product. Um, you know, when I came into office and when Governor Youngkin came into office, uh, he pledged to create the best in class history standards that were going to tell all of our history, the good and the bad. Uh, and we've done that. And I would encourage anyone who hasn't had a chance to read our history standards, our civic standards, you, uh, you can do it in under an hour. They're really good. For the first time in Virginia's history, every single child in Virginia schools will learn that slavery is the primary reason for the Civil War, uh, which has never been done before. And we put lots of other things in to make sure that Virginians can see, all Virginians can see themselves in that history. Um, and so I'm really proud of that. And I feel like that that is, we ended up with a great product because we had lots of input. Over 200 different organizations took a role in having input and gathering that together. And we ended up with something that I think is a, is a model for the country. On the higher education space, um, this concept of civil discourse, of diversity of, of ideas, um, of, of free expression is one that we are aiming to make a hallmark of a Virginia education at all levels. And for the first time ever last fall, uh, Governor Youngkin uh, hosted a summit at UVA um, where we had every single one of our uh, 15 four-year public universities, all 23 of our two-year community colleges, and also we had about half to two-thirds, I need to get that number straight, of our private institutions gathered for a day-long summit to talk about those important topics. And we brought in national organizations that can tell us what does best-in-class look like when we want to create cultures on our campuses that believe in this is part of an education. Part of an education is ensuring not only that we're preparing people to be prepared to be productive members of our economy, but it's also about preparing our, our graduates to be informed members of our democracies and engaged members of our communities. And that was the conversation we were having that day. So our institutions are leading the way, many of them, working with braver angels, working um, with citizens and scholars, working um, with a bipartisan policy center. We brought Heterodox Academy. We brought in all these groups that are already working in our institutions and said, how do we learn from each other? And right now, literally on my desk is a stack of the action plans that every university and college is putting together about what they're going to do differently to build that campus culture that really appreciates um, how do we help our students learn how to listen with good intent? How do we learn people to come together and understand um, that how you listen, how you speak, how you enter a conversation is different, and also it is fundamental to making sure that our democracy and our way of life continues. So I'm really excited about both those things. Terrific examples as well. So when we all gathered to prepare our conversation for today, President Patton charged us with the task of making democracy concrete. 
And I think that's what you've heard across all of the examples in this panel. Democracy is kids in a classroom with different perspectives on the issue of guns, engaging head and heart together to start to make conversational space and explore new solution pathways. It is people across Virginia engaging on the question of the standards. Again, a lot of emotion involved in that. It's an academic subject, but heck of a lot of emotion attached. And you have to have people who can facilitate meetings, help people work through those disagreements to solutions and compromises. Kids walking about towns in Kansas and coming to know their community and see its possibilities for improvement. Jewish and Muslim students baking and selling and eating food together and also participating in housing debates in local town government. These are very, very concrete cases and what we see, again, head, heart, people making space for conversation, skills of facilitation, basic background of knowledge supporting all that effort. I want to put one more example of how civic learning can help bridge the divides on the table for you. This is the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap. Um, Louise Dubay mentioned this at the very top of the meeting. Many of you contributed to developing the roadmap. Released in 2021, it is a framework for excellence in, in history and civics learning for all learners K through 12. And the very principles that we've been talking about today are at its heart. Inquiry is at its heart. It's not a curriculum, it's a set of questions that learners should have the chance to engage with. Um, it has a set of principles in it, like reflective patriotism, the idea that it is possible to facilitate and support a love of country at the same time that you're supporting open, honest, critical engagement with our successes and our failures. It's about people doing work together. The roadmap took 300 people to write, um, and we too had lots of disagreements, and we brought head and heart to that work as well. We had to debate things like, were we educating for a democracy or a republic? Um, and we compromised on a constitutional democracy. We had to debate questions of how we talk about the history of race and enslavement, just as you've heard in several examples here. And there too, we compromised. We introduced a vision of confident pluralism, where we can recognize all the different assets people bring from different backgrounds, whether of ethnicity or culture or religion or viewpoint or experience. And we have a job to make the space for us to do our work together um, to find compromises in our common life. So we really want to lift up the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap. We hope you'll read it. We hope you'll engage with it. Consider whether it can be a tool to support your own effort to make democracy concrete um, as a part of the learning experience for learners in your classrooms or in your contexts. But the last thing I want to say, again, is just a huge thank you um, to all of our panelists. It's not easy to share stories. It's not easy to really reveal the sort of personal aspects of this hard work. Um, so courage is another key civic virtue that you've all seen exemplified this morning. Um, so if we could all give our panelists a great, thankful round of applause. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And now, an important message from Governor Spencer Cox of Utah. Hi, I'm Governor Spencer Cox of the great state of Utah and chair of the National Governors Association. This year as chair, I launched an initiative to address the divisiveness we're seeing in our country. Governors and citizens across the nation are tired of hyper-partisanship and polarization. We need to learn to persuade without hating each other and attack ideas, not people. That's the core of the Disagree Better initiative. Now, you might ask, why am I bringing this message to you during Civic Learning Week? You see, I believe, and many of my fellow governors on both sides of the aisle would agree that teaching our young people about government and debate is one of the most effective things we can do to reduce partisan animosity. If we can ground our young people in civic ed education, giving them a sense of intellectual curiosity, humility, empathy, and a willingness to see complexity, then we can change the narrative that the people we disagree with are bad people or trying to destroy our country. 
Civic learning provides a solution to keeping us together as a nation. And the polling reflects what I've heard in conversations. More than two thirds of GOP primary voters, Democratic primary voters, and K through 12 parents alike think teaching civics is more important than it was just five years ago. What's more, a 2021 Heritage Foundation poll found that nearly three out of four teachers and four out of five parents wanted more time spent on civics. This is one of those areas upon which there is actually broad agreement. But the great thing about civics is that it can also help us all disagree better. I'm grateful for the professionals, volunteers, educators in every subject, in after school programs and Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops, with YMCAs and American Legion chapters, all making the necessary human investments to keep our country strong. And in Utah, I was proud to sign HB 273, which provided $1.5 million in grants to support constitutional literacy initiatives, media literacy, and digital citizenship, and academic service learning. Like in many states, advancing civic education, this was a bipartisan bill, one where not everybody got what they wanted, but came together around a shared idea. Investment in civic learning is not only an investment in our students and educators, it is an investment in all of our citizens, our communities, our state, and our constitutional democracy. On behalf of my fellow governors, I want to thank our educators. The work you do in teaching and modeling deep inquiry and respect for differences is one of the most important contributions to the future of our democracy. Keep up the great work. Our nation owes you a debt of gratitude. We will now take a 15 minute break. Please rejoin us at 10.55 a.m.
We will resume the program in five minutes. Please find your seats. The program will begin shortly. Please find your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the program will begin shortly. Please make your way back to the auditorium and find your seats. And now, an important message from Governor Jared Polis of Colorado.
Hi, I'm Colorado Governor Jared Polis, and I'm so excited to celebrate Civic Learning Week with all of you. Here in Colorado, we know that young people are the most important part of our future. That's for the same for our state, for our country, frankly, for its civil society and for our democracy. Civic Learning Week is an amazing opportunity to highlight the importance of civic engagement and to celebrate the amazing work taking place across the country to engage young people in our democracy to help keep us healthy. The theme of this gathering, civic learning as a unifying force, shows us that when we disagree better, it makes all of us stronger. It strengthens our society and our democracy. When we lean into rather than away from hard conversations and know how to have them, we all come out better. And that's something I'm passionate about. I'm working alongside Governor Cox from Utah on an initiative called Disagree Better through the National Governors Association focused on how we can have the tough conversations, disagree on issues, but still respect one another. Governor Cox and I don't agree on everything, but the ability to have these conversations and not demonize one another, it's important to preserve our democracy and improve America. We all have a role to play in building strong, vibrant democracy and Civic Learning Week is a key part of that effort and an opportunity for us to double down on disagreeing better. Thank you. Please welcome Nudia Hyatt of Circle at Tufts University Tiss College for a research talk. Good afternoon. So, um, what roles do schools play in sustaining democracy? How do classroom experiences shape how young Americans understand and value democratic processes? How does encouragement from teachers influence how young people think about elections and voting? These are some of the questions we do and explore in our research at Circle. Circle is a nonpartisan research center that looks at youth civic engagement in the United States. And today, I'm really excited to share new research and new data from Circle on how high school civic learning experiences influence young people's perceptions about elections and voting. We surveyed a nationally represented group of young people and we asked them to recall how their high school civic learning experiences influence civic behaviors today. And I want to hone in on this connection between civic learning and civic engagement and how it's really different for young people from different racial identities. So to start, let's look at some context. So let's look at some context on how education influences and shapes youth voter turnout in presidential elections. And by youth, I mean between the ages of 18 to 29 in this case. Now on this graph, I want to emphasize two takeaways. First, that um, the gaps that you see, first, education as a whole, and you know this, has a huge impact on how young people vote. So you already know the more education young people have, the more likely they'll vote when they're young. But that size of gap might really surprise you. So young people who did not finish high school and young people who obtained a four-year college degree, the difference in turnout is about 50 points. Second, that gap has not shrunk in the past five decades. So in the last two decades that Circle has been doing research, we know that young people that receive high quality civics education are more likely to be civically engaged, including more likely to vote. We also know that two in five young people do not get to have a college experience. That means that the civic learning experiences they have in high school are one critical pathway to lifelong civic engagement. And that's what I wanna focus on a bit, on how high school experiences and high school educators can really influence lifelong civic engagement for young people. So first, high school educators can influence young people's behavior and can encourage students to vote and it makes a difference. We asked this question in 2020 and a lot of young people responded and said that those who had encouragement for teachers were less likely to say that um, voting was a waste of time. 
Then we asked this question again in our most recent data in 2023. We asked who in high school encouraged them to vote and broke out those responses by racial and ethnic identity groups. A little over half of young adults, and um, these are young adults between the ages of 18 to 34, recall getting encouragement to vote from their high school teachers. And you can see evidence of racial disparities here where Latino and black youth recall receiving less encouragement to vote, to, to encouragement for voting for, than their white and Asian peers. Next, we asked them if they took a civics or government course in high school. The good news is that at least two and three young people said that they took a government or civics course in high school. Then we also asked them whether these experiences in the classroom helped them understand the critical importance of democratic procedures. And here again, we see evidence of racial disparities. So for instance, there's a 30 point difference between an Asian student recalling that their high school classroom experience was really important in understanding the critical importance of democratic procedures and a black student. So it's not just enough to take a high school civics course or a government course. It has to be meaningful and it has to be impactful. And from the racial gaps, we see that black and Latino youth are finding these civic learning opportunities less meaningful and less impactful for them. So at a time when we see democracy backsliding and we have decades of evidence that there have been persistent inequities on in who gets access to high quality civics education, what is that one thing we can do that can really make a difference in our classroom and schools. It is to center student voice and opinions in a meaningful way. And by student voice, I mean spaces where students' opinions and perspectives are meaningful and are a big part of what happens in the classroom and overall school climate. Our new research finds that student voice directly predicts civic engagement and likelihood to vote. In other words, young people who had experiences as a student, whether in the classroom, in student groups or with school leaders in which they felt that their opinion and their voices mattered were more likely to say that they took civic actions and were also more likely to say that they will vote in this year's presidential elections. Here again though, we see evidence of racial inequality. So we see only about a third of black and Asian students and about two in five Latino and white students recalling ever getting such an experience in high school where they felt that their voice was heard. So I want to emphasize two takeaways in conclusion. First, student voice that is critical and inclusive in high school directly impacts young people's civic behavior, including likelihood to vote. Second, we need to take proactive steps to make civic learning experiences more inclusive and more accessible to young people from different racial identities. Otherwise, the persistent inequities we see in voting and participation will remain. Thank you. And now, Dean Michael Fuhr of the George Washington University Graduate School of Education and Human Development, moderating a discussion on elections as a teachable moment. Teaching civic education during the 2024 elections. Can it be done? Well, good morning. Again, you've heard that a lot. Welcome to George Washington University. I want to just, yeah, okay, good, a little shout out. Um, it's a terrific place to be thinking about these issues. You know, uh, President Washington, General Washington, dreamed of an institution of higher learning in the nation's capital that would be devoted to the public good. And unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to see this, and I think if he saw what was going on here today, he'd have probably been a little surprised, but um, it was chartered in 1821 by Congress to pay homage to General Washington. And that means that we're somewhere in our 203rd year of trying to enact this ideal of bringing education to the public good. So it's wonderful to see you all here and on behalf of my various leaders and the administration and my faculty and staff at GW, a very big 
welcome to all of you. Uh, we have a, an interesting conversation planned. We had a little bit of time to prep in advance, but I warned our, my colleagues here that um, they would have to do a little bit of improvisational theater. And I would like this to be sort of conversational, but let me start it off with um, an observation that um, is a kind of good news, bad news framing of, for me at least, the fact that we have this incredible revival of public interest in civics is really good news. The somewhat bad news is to think about what has brought about this revival of interest in civics education. And I think that is in part the um, somewhat persistent evidence that our great democracy is fragile and that there are many people who are really concerned about whether the guardrails of democracy can hold. And therefore, whenever our great country is facing any kind of stress and strain, attention turns to the schools. And that's partly because of how much we cherish our education system and how much we count on it to be the basis, the foundation, the hope for the future. So I know we're not supposed to use words like hope and all of that, I appreciate that. I'm reminded of the story about the difference between the pessimist and the optimist. The pessimist who says things can't get any worse and the optimist says, oh yes they can. <laughs> with that, I want to start off with um, something that we try, to, we try to encourage in education, which is the three R's. Relevance, relevance, relevance. And I'm gonna ask our two colleagues who are involved in teaching today to start us off maybe with an example or two from your daily work and life with young people that is an example of the relevance of what's going on in school to the world that we are experiencing, that our young people are experiencing, and that they are facing. So let's start with Rashid. Say a word about yourself yes. and then go from there. First of all, hello everyone. My name is Rashid DeRoso. I'm the Civics Program Director at Democracy Prep Public Schools. We are a K through 12 civic education network founded with the explicit mission of preparing young folks for lives of active citizenship and engagement. Um, I am constantly moved and excited uh, in my role because I get to engage with over 17 different campuses in New York, Texas, and Nevada, uh, operating in dramatically different contexts, but still seeing the same demand from our students, the same enthusiasm from our students to talk about world issues, and the same commitment from our educators to create spaces where our students are encouraged to engage with one another, whether that's through community circles or creating opportunities for our high schoolers and ensuring that they are uh, offered the opportunity to consider registering to vote. And so we've recommitted to uh, ensuring that 100% of our students are approached by a staff member, thinking about the previous presentation, 100% um, of them are approached by a staff member, encouraged to vote. Obviously it's a choice, a personal choice that they make, but given information that is balanced. Um, and so I think to your specific question, we've just seen a number of students actually taking the lead, preparing lessons to teach younger students about the importance of their voices and what it means to be engaged in their communities. So I'll stop there, but we have quite a few other examples as well. We will get back to hearing more about those examples. Lawrence, a word about yourself and some stories from the front line. Sure, first, good morning. My name is Lawrence Staten. I'm privileged to serve as the chair of the history department at Washington Latin Public Charter School. I'd like to give a special shout out to my sixth grade civics class. They are currently learning about the US Constitution right now. Uh, in fact, today, while I'm here, they're learning about Brown versus Board of Education and Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, so from the front lines, um, education and civic involvement is so important. 
Uh, it's important to me as an educator that my students see how and what their government is doing impacts them. Uh, most recent example is when we were talking about, for example, the national debt. And I put the US national debt clock up on the screen and we talked about what their government was spending money on in real time. And I said to them, it's important you understand what your government is doing because one day you're going to be voters. You're going to have to make informed decisions about who you vote for, who you support, and what you believe. Now, I personally, as an educator, believe that there are some fundamental things and fundamental truths that we all should be able to agree on as an American. But it is important for me and my students that they are informed citizens and that they're able to make their own informed choices about who and what they are as Americans and what they believe. Thank you so much, uh, Lawrence. Uh, I'm gonna pivot here now for a moment and turn to someone who is kind of at the intersection of education and politics. And I'm gonna ask you, uh, Trenton, if you can, first of all, say something about yourself, what you're doing, but think a little bit about the extent to which people in government can be uh, receptive to what people are teaching and learning in school. We have this ideal in US culture that government can be influenced by science, by research, by education, by knowledge. You're right there at that, at that hazardous intersection, and I'd love you to say a few words about that. Yeah. My name is Trenton Eilander. Thank you guys for being here today. I'm currently an undergraduate college student at the University of Iowa, working on my bachelor's degree in uh, applied sciences, as well as a strong emphasis in political science. A native Iowan, come from the Midwest. We farm, uh, grow corn and soybeans, as you guys may know. And I am a fellow with the Ronald Reagan Institute this year. When we were presented with some facts, preparing for this panel, I was made of a situation so devastating, I refused to believe it. 70% of Americans are proud to vote. 68% believe that their vote matters. 30% do not. 30% out of our entire population. So, as I continue to work at the Iowa State Capitol, I am a legislative house clerk. I've worked there two years. Last year I double clerked. This year I've kind of taken a break a little bit with some extended travels that I've had the privilege to do. For our friends in the press that place a high premium on accuracy, I was shocked when I read these facts. And I brought them up in our panel. When I talk to legislators, when I talk to lobbyists, this is not something that's discussed. We're always focused on who voted for in the last presidential election and judging someone else based on other moral principles and characters because we can't get along. In Iowa, we may not see that as much, being first in the nation caucus, because we make civic education a part of our daily lives. And we may not see that on the east or west coast. I'm not putting any states under, under the bus, so don't, don't quote me on that press. But that's why I believe Iowa has remained first in the nation caucus, because we contribute to civic education as a part of our daily lives. You don't have to remind me to go vote because I know it's my constitutional duty. And I wanna quote President Washington because I would be remiss if I had not done so. President Washington reminded the people in his first inaugural address to the first joint session of Congress that the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply perhaps finally staked on the experiment, experiment excuse me, entrusted to the hands of the American people. That's our constitutional duty. The spirit of our democracy is through our constitutional duty, and we need to remember and remind American citizens to declare their independence to engage in civics. Wow. I wouldn't argue with you, and I wouldn't argue with General Washington either, so that's <laughs> terrific. I want to turn to uh, Professor John Zimmerman, 
a colleague uh, in the uh, trenches of higher education where things are in terms of civics and democracy and everything, uh, some of you have probably read about this, a little bit uh, troubled these days. Um, John, let me ask you this. Um, there's a long tradition and a deep literature about how important politics is to education. This session is actually not about the politics of education as much as about the education for politics. I'm just wondering if you can reflect a little bit on, for example, the long tradition we've had in education, the ideal of preparing young people how to think more than preparing them what to think. Can you say something about this business of narrative and evidence as you see it these days? Well, Michael, could you ask a broader question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm John Zimmerman. I teach at Penn. I'm delighted to be on this panel. It turns out you have to be a dude to be on this panel. Yeah. I wasn't, wasn't aware of that. Um, uh, look, you know, a... I think the ideal that Michael is describing has always been observed in the breach. By that, I mean it's always been there rhetorically, right? But if you look into the past, I think, it's, uh, uh, I think it's too easy to imagine some romantic, nostalgic era where we were all taught to think for ourselves. To the contrary, I think that uh, American K-12 through schools have largely been devoted to indoctrinating certain ideas. Um, and uh, you know, uh, there's been change over time. And I wrote a book about 20 years ago called Who's America? in which I argued that one of the changes has been that we've added more groups to the narrative you described, which is obviously a salutary thing. But the problem was, I argued in 2002, we didn't ask what should happen to that narrative once we start including these different groups. We folded them into the same story, which is why the title of the textbook remained the same, right? Rise of the American Nation, Quest for Liberty. And it was Jim Lowen who unfortunately passed away, had that great line. Have you ever noticed the physics textbook is not called Triumph of the Atom, right? <laughs> Rise of the Periodic Table, right? <laughs> Only the history book. And so obviously I celebrated this ideal of inclusion, but I bemoaned the idea that even though we were including these new groups, we weren't asking hard questions about what that inclusion should do to the way we think about the big story. Well, Michael, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that I wrote the new edition, which came out in, uh, 20 years later in 2022, is I think a lot of those questions did come to the fore, absolutely. But I don't think we have the vocabulary or the will to really debate them in our schools. What that requires is not just the sort of pedagogical training, I think, that other speakers have acutely referred to, but I think it also requires all of us as citizens to have a commitment to actually engaging those questions and sometimes being on the losing end of them. Who actually wants that? Um, you know, as a student of mine once pointed out, you'll never see an interest group called People for Debating the Other Side in Schools. <laughs> right? Yeah. More nuance, more nuance. Uh, that doesn't really fit on a poster. People enter this arena because they want their point of view privileged. And I think until more of us are willing to lose, nothing's going to change. Well, this, this is a good way for me to get back to our working educators and ask to what extent are you facing this struggle or this tension between uh, appreciating that young people are learning in an environment of great external turbulence and conflict of ideas, to what extent is your role as an educator to promote student development of skill and knowledge that allows them to figure out some of what's going on? And how do you do that without going into the word that John mentioned, indoctrination? Can you talk a little bit about that if you see where I'm heading here? Uh, this is a big problem in K-12 education. So tell us something that will cheer me up about the future here. Uh, I, I can't promise I'll absolutely cheer you up, but um, I will say for me, um, as an educator, one of the things I like to do is teach history and civics. History and civics is compelling enough 
without getting into the realm of indoctrination. Um, teaching the facts is what I like to do. And I would prefer my students not know my own personal political beliefs. I would prefer to let them make their own conclusions. I prefer to let them come to their own understanding of you know, how our government's supposed to work, how civics is supposed to inform their own ideas. And if we can have civil conversation when, we, when there's disagreement, then I think that's what you know, is important that we have a civil conversation and a civil exchange of ideas, and we can agree on some things, and there are some things we'll disagree on, and my students do this all the time, where they will argue over a political idea, and I just sit back and let them have at it, because it's way more fun to watch these young people share their ideas and their thoughts than to have them listening to me all the time. Trent, I know that you're, you're going to get in on this because I want to know where legislators are if they were to listen to this sort of conversation. But hold that thought for a moment. Tell us an example, Rashid, where you are facing this tension between wanting to be relevant, wanting young people to argue ideas, but stopping short of letting them know kind of where they should be heading in their ideas. Yes, I, I first wanted to express my appreciation for what you expressed. I, I think it's so important for us to really elevate the importance of quality history and social studies instruction, first and foremost. I think it's important for us also to have a conversation about the importance of social emotional skills as we do that. We need to establish norms in our classrooms for how, to, how we engage with one another. Because especially in this time of polarization, it's so important that we understand that we're not going to solve problems by avoiding ideas with which we don't agree, and we're also not gonna solve them by just fighting. So how do we build consensus? How do we turn a debate into a deliberation? Um, and I think ultimately, it's on the, a number of different players in, in the game to, to really figure out, well, how are teachers preparing lessons that are providing balanced information for students to draw their own conclusions, first and foremost? Because I think we need to be emphasizing to our young folks that their voices matter. And in a moment, or probably later, I'll talk about the next level of not just understanding that your voice matters in an abstract way, but building classroom and school communities where our students understand that not only does my voice matter, but my voice in a collective of other folks whose voices are united after deliberation, after debate, after discussion, can affect positive change. We're going to come back because I'm going to press you for an, an example of a topic, an issue, a, a, a conflict that comes up where you have had to actually try to hold the line between uh, evidence narrative and values and ideology and some of those other multisyllabic words that we education researchers like to throw around a lot. But Trent, let me ask you this. Imagine that this conversation is taking place at the State House in Iowa. Would the legislation, would the legislators have the patience for all of this or would there be a sense of, come on, the school is just supposed to teach the kids how to read, write, and count? And let's get on with it. Now, I'm being a little bit vulgar about it here, but I'm curious as to whether there is a receptor site in the legislature for this kind of what I consider to be quite enlightened thinking about the nature of pedagogy and classroom life. Say something about that. Well, for, I, wanna, I wanna make this clear that as a clerk, I am not allowed to speak when legislators talk. <laughs> okay, I want to make that clear. I, I've done that once. I've, I got in trouble. We moved forward. I don't do it anymore. That is the w number one rule clerking is that when they are talking, you are silent. I'm okay? I'm talking about this. I think it's very healthy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're probably watching right now anyway. Um, so one of the things that maybe not in Iowa, but that I've been hearing around, maybe not just in the Iowa State House, is that when it comes to civic engagement, when I was in eighth grade, every Friday we would say the Pledge of Allegiance. We would stand up, we would place our hand over our heart, and I would say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. And they were removing that from public schools. Maybe not private schools, 
but we don't even say it at our universities anymore. That should be the first thing we do at a public ceremony at a university, is stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. The legislators should be acting to put that back in public schools. That teaches civic education. Last week, I laid my great-grandfather down to, to rest. He was a World War II veteran in the United States Navy, and he was about the highest that you could be as a Navy frogman and hospital corpsman. I listened to his stories traveling down to Panama. I listened to his stories in the war as a Navy frogman disarming the seas in the South China Sea after the United States bombed Japan. To see him still salute the flag at the age of 95 was heartening for me. And that's how we teach civic engagement because back in my hometown in Newton, Iowa, every Memorial Day, every Veterans Day, we have all the veterans that associate with the American Legion and the VFW. And they go to each school district in our community. And we have the little children, fifth graders to eighth graders, come out and say thank you for your service. That's what I would say is the number one thing is to how we teach civic engagement is to remind them of our founding principles. The Pledge of Allegiance, like my great grandfather, who fought for our flag and many more now and our US Armed Forces are fighting for now. Well, thank you for that and our condolences and sympathies. I wanna now try again an example of where this tension comes up. And let me preface it with a story that a very distinguished uh, education scholar and historian tells. His name is James Banks from the University of Washington. And he tells the story about growing up in, I believe it's Marietta in Arkansas, a very segregated uh, area when he was growing up in school. And in the classroom, they were learning all about constitutional principles, the Declaration of Independence, we're all created equal and all of that. And then he had to go outside and encounter an entirely different reality, which he refers to as a sort of cognitive dissonance that he was at you know, the young age of 12 or 13 having to cope with. What's happening now in your schools where young people are learning about civics, democracy, American history, and then facing a reality that they're needing some kind of realignment to figure out. Lawrence, take it. So uh, uh, an example to like that sort of cognitive dissonance. Um, in my class, since this panel is really about elections, right? The Electoral College. Uh, in 2016, uh, my students didn't understand at the time, because we hadn't quite learned about the Electoral College yet, they didn't understand how Senator, the then Secretary Hillary Clinton could get more votes and not be president. And their argument was, well, we're a democracy, whoever gets the most votes wins. That's what a democracy is. And having to explain to them that the framers of our Constitution had this innate fear of unchecked democracy, and so they created this idea of an electoral college where all the states would be represented, where you know, you couldn't just campaign in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, and Houston, win all the big cities uh, and become president. That was a real moment of cognitive dissonance for them when they had to realize, you know, to, to coin a phrase I'm sure, you know, Trent's probably heard of, it's not just the coast, but, you know, flyover country matters too, that there's several states in the middle of the country that also have a say in how we elect a president. Uh, and they've learned over time, and you know, once, you know, shameless plug here, once they played Win the White House on iCivics, um, <laughs> they, they figured out that it's not always about popular vote, that you have to win the right combination of states in order to be elected president. And so now that they've gone through multiple elections you know, over the years and they're paying more attention, they start to understand that tension between you know, pure democracy and what we have in a constitutional republic. 
Well, that's a terrific example because it reminds me that the title of this is about elections as a teachable moment. So are you also facing this kind of thing where young people are wondering about you know, the next nine months and how does that actually connect with the, the rather grand theory of the American principles of government? So I will provide some context for, for folks in the audience that uh, in my particular role, I am not directly in the classroom. So a lot of my work is really related to the oversight of a lot of the materials that are produced in the production of some of our core resources. So what I will say is that as our students are thinking about the election, and because we educate a scholar population that is predominantly, uh, it belongs predominantly to historically marginalized and underrepresented communities, a lot of the thinking about some of our values comes into play where we never will want to present a lesson or a topic of discussion that renders an, an identity or someone's sense of safety or value as something that is open to debate. We won't do that. We'll never create a space where students do not feel that their identities are something that, that, is, that can be treated frivolously. And so for a lot of conversations about current events as they relate to immigration, as they relate to migration, as they relate to a lot of policies uh, so far as conversations about LGBTQIA plus identities and racial justice, uh, we have to be careful to present information in a way that is balanced for our students, but in a way that also honors their identities. So I would say that is one of the greater conflicts because we, we always wanna be conscious of every single student identity in our classrooms and, and the ones that may not necessarily be physically present in our classrooms but must be considered. Uh, I want to turn back now to uh, my colleague here in higher education. Uh, some of what we do is actually prepare future educators. And, well, we hope, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, I guess my question is, John, do you, leaving aside this debate about, as Sam pointed out, that some people think it should start in pre-K and some people think in sixth grade and some people, to what extent is there some hope for improving, enriching, giving our educators more tools at the point of preparing future educators. In other words, colleges of education, of which the George Washington University has, of course, one of the finest. <laughs> Leaving that aside, to what can we be doing to prepare future educators to be equipped in these kinds of tough classroom situations? Well, look, I think that's the question of the day because when you survey American teachers and you ask them as part of your pre-service training, did you receive instruction and practice in instructing controversial issues? Uh, most of them say no. Um, and so in a way, it's what the professors call overdetermined, right? We shouldn't be surprised that discussion of controversial issues happens so irregularly when in fact we don't expose the people that are supposed to lead it um, uh, to the mechanisms for doing so. Um, the other thing that I think the other important context to think about is that since a lot of this discussion up here has been about history, I mean, there are still states in this country where you can teach history in a public school having studied almost no history in college. And that's an enormous problem if what you want is a really deep, fruitful deliberation about these issues. I couldn't teach a chemistry class. And it's not because I'm not like a good person or a smart person or an educated person. It's because I don't understand the discipline. Uh, I could get you to memorize the periodic table, but I think most reasonable people would say that that's not teaching chemistry. The reason I can't do it is that I don't understand the history of the discipline, what counts as a question, what counts as an answer. And I would submit to you that there are lots of people teaching history in this country right now who don't know that either. And that's an enormous problem. An interesting reminder of the the, the importance of joining content knowledge with pedagogical knowledge, which is, of course, one of our, one of our things in education schools. I'm going to surprise you now a little bit with the way I'd like to wrap up this conversation. Um, years ago, a political scientist in education wrote a very interesting short book called, I Used to Think 
and now I think. And I would like us to model something that I would love to see more people doing in more schools, which is admitting that they came in with a lot of very strong ideas, but they learned something along the way. So here's my example. I used to think that we were much better in the US at separating kind of factual knowledge from indoctrination. And I now think that I better reread John Zimmerman's book about this because I'm probably dealing with an incomplete awareness of this. Just wait for the film adaptation. We're waiting for the film. <laughs> yeah. well, they're never the same book and movie. Right? You may I mean, not know all, this, but John is that. going to be the next yeah. MC for the Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, any, any, anybody want to take on this thing? What have you heard here today that has given you something new to think about or a different way to think about any of this? I'll say Please. something. I have a lot of respect for all of you guys here today, and I just can't tell you what a privilege it is for me to be here to listen to experts such as yourself on civic engagement. When Mr. Zimmerman was talking about his book, I was a little bit reminded about the book that we read as a part of the fellowship with the Ronald Reagan Institute was When Character Was King. And as I was reading that, every time we'd come back to D.C. and we went out to California once, we were always you know, asked about what chapter was this? What did we learn from it? How can we contribute to it? And it really made me resonate with what President Reagan left us, the unfinished work that both him and Mrs. Reagan left behind, civic education, when character was king. What have we lost? And I, and I want to read your book, um, so I'm, I'm going to write it down. But that, I just want to resonate when character was king, because I really like that book, and it's on my shelf. So. You see, I used to think that my book was the best. Now I'm going <laughs> to yeah. read John's book. Yeah. I used to think that folks who have the capacity and ability to vote and don't vote was attributed to apathy. Now I understand that a lot of the time it's due to the absence of a sense of efficacy. And a lot of our work in schools needs to be centered around helping young people understand, as I had mentioned early, yeah, your voice matters, but how am I showing you that your voice matters? What am I building in my classroom and my school to make sure that you are having some kind of parallel experience of participating in a democratic process? Is that a student council? And if it is, are the counselors actually meeting with administration? Are the decisions that they're making actually going to affect school culture? Am I creating an opportunity for kids to weigh in on ballot measures in your state or for them to have a parallel voting experience and seeing, oh, well, I voted for this person and this person won or didn't win. Let's talk about why. So I, I think to the extent that we can continue to build a sense of faith in our ability to affect systems, we can move away from a deficit mindset of saying, well, people aren't voting because they don't care, or people aren't voting for X, Y, or Z reason. And also just in general, taking that step back to actually ask, well, why aren't people voting? For whatever percentage are we asking those people, like, why, why are you not engaged, or what could we do earlier to support you? Evidence for me that this session has had added value. <laughs> Lawrence. Uh. When I started in education almost, gosh, 15 years ago, I used to think that just by showing up and talking about and teaching about how great I believed in this country's greatness and how great this country was, I used to believe that would just be enough. The story of America and how we've grown and tried to include more people in our national story, I used to think that was enough. But as I've gotten older and more seasoned in education, I've learned that I'm dealing with the generation of students who have grown up seeing a global pandemic. They've grown up seeing school shootings that never happened when I was a kid that they, they see social justice movements like uh, Black Lives Matter and you know, the George Floyd movements. And now it's about reaching students where they are and helping them understand that their voice matters, that they need to be involved in this process because one day 
uh, they're going to be the majority in this country, that they're going to be the leaders of this country and that they have to be invested in not just their own civic education, but in that sense of community that ultimately they're going to be the leaders and they're gonna be the ones who have to make hard decisions about the future of this country. So for me now, it's about reaching students where they are and bringing them along so that they can find themselves in our national story as well. John Zimmerman, you used to think something and you think now differently? I used to think that Americans wanted to deliberate their differences because that's what I call democratic. But I'm not so sure about that now. Um, if I were king, and we don't have enough time, since we're over time, to enumerate all the reasons that won't happen, um, every high school kid would receive the 1619 Project and the state-approved textbook, both. And then the teacher would say, okay, let's start with Columbus. What does 1619 say? What does the state-approved textbook say? Let's do the revolution, same. But that's not happening. I mean, it is in some places, but for the most part it isn't because that sort of exercise that I call democratic, not enough people want. So is it even democratic, right? If those pesky taxpayers and citizens that elect school boards don't want it, if the demos doesn't want it, maybe I've been, shall we say, urinating into the wind for my career, <laughs> um, uh, imagining that's democratic when in fact it isn't because the demos doesn't want it. Another way of looking at this is people like me haven't done a good enough job in persuading the demos that they should want that. It, I won't stop trying, but it hasn't worked. On the idea of not stopping trying, I started with a little joke about pessimists and optimists. I'll give you another one. That the real difference is pessimists have more data. <laughs> However, for me, this event and these people are very strong data, evidence of why we are going to succeed with this. So I want to thank you all, and I want to thank you all, and keep up the good work. I think we're at time. Please welcome Dan Vallone of More in Common for our final research talk. So when I was about five years old, I went with my dad to work one day. My dad was a middle school teacher and his class was launching rockets that day. I spent the whole morning with my dad in his class. We ate lunch together. And then we went outside and we set up our rocket launchers. These are pretty simple devices. You just hit a button and a small burst of gas launched a styrofoam rocket up into the air. All the other students started having a blast launching their rockets into the air, but when it came to my turn, I was nervous. I was maybe a little scared that my rocket would blow up. I was maybe anxious a little bit about what would happen if my rocket didn't work at all in front of all my friends, new friends. But my dad coached me through and I had all of these other students cheering me on and so I hit the button and boom, my rocket launched into the sky. I can remember seeing it disappear in the sun as it headed up into the sky. And that moment has stayed with me my whole life. And when we think about civics learning or learning in general, it's kind of one of, the, it's a moment we think a lot about right, when seemingly a whole new world of possibilities opens up. But when we think about those kinds of moments, it's easy to focus on the rocket in the sky, right, that singular moment of agency, that acquisition of new knowledge, the new tool, the new device, the new resource. But when it comes to civics learning, we need to change our focus from the rocket in the sky to the scene on the ground. Because with me that day, I had my dad. I had my fellow students, and I had the rocket. The rocket matters. But without my dad and my fellow students, it's just metal, gas, and styrofoam. But with my dad and fellow students, suddenly I have role models, relationships, and an active agency. 
This is the vital triangle of civics learning. And right now, for most Americans, unfortunately, this triangle is nowhere to be found. In new research that Warren Common conducted with over 100 Americans, over 40% said they had no civic role model whatsoever. These American adults were more than twice as likely to say that the, they learn about civics through a solitary endeavor, such as reading the news, than anything social. And close to three in four of these adults say they don't belong to any group that regularly talks about civics. Civics is inherently social. It is we the people. And we can't transform civics learning when our civic scenes are solitary. When our civic scenes are empty, even with the most advanced rocketry, the best we can hope to achieve is the cold emptiness of space. But when our civic scenes are filled, when they're filled with people who love us, people who can show us what it means to be a good citizen, people who can stand with us and make us feel like we are part of something bigger, then all it takes is a few pieces of styrofoam, and as John McGee once wrote, we can touch the face of God. Thank you. And now, closing reflections by Raj Vinakota of the Institute for Citizens and Scholars. Thank you, thank you very much. Dan Vallone, that was amazing. I can't believe I have to follow that on. Uh, I'm Raj Vinakota, I'm president at the Institute for Citizens and Scholars. Uh, and I have, to be honest with you, this morning's favorite word was not AI. It was hope, 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 hope. So Louise, I think we're in trouble. Since we're not supposed to mention that word, I think it was mentioned every single time. Uh, but seriously, in thinking about how we even try to categorize or try to capture the themes from this morning, I'll use how uh, the Institute for Citizens and Scholars talks and thinks about what it takes to make an informed and effective citizen, which is that we look at three major categories. We want to ensure that any person, and in this case young people, are civically well informed, that they're productively engaged for the common good, and that they're committed to democracy in America. And I think that we got great examples this morning, in fact concrete examples, as Danielle talked about uh, in her session, across all of these areas, right? If you start with civically well-informed, much of the research plus the conversations up here talked about the core need for content to drive so much of the conversation. How are we making sure, right, when we have teachers who start and say, I want to start with civics and government and history and go from there and the research talking about that. But the research also pointing out a couple things that may be obvious, but it's always good to see data, especially if you're a pessimist, I hear. Um, number one is that um, underrepresented populations need uh, even more work and how we engage and make sure that this happens well. And secondly, that we're starting to see trends that if you create limitations for how teachers can approach this, it makes the teaching much harder. In this notion of being civically well-informed, the other area that is, of course, exceedingly clear from this morning's conversation is what do we do with information literacy? How do we think about that? And even there, content seems to be a very interesting place for us to start. Um, but I was especially moved by the conversation around teachers, right? That we need to support the teachers in order to educate the students. We can't blame young people who don't know how to use something that they've never been taught to use. We're all driving blind. So making sure that we spend enough time not just thinking about the students, but also how are we educating the teachers? How are we supporting them in order that so we can make sure that anything that we try to actually convey around information literacy is done effectively becomes especially critical. Um, finally, I'm also always heartened when I see conversations around content around being well informed, going beyond just, just the social studies, and you start talking about them in other areas, because being a citizen is not just about understanding the social studies, right? And there are so many ways that you can bring this into curricula, into even going outside of uh, the classroom that become very important. And so it was great to hear that. 
When it comes to productive engagement, I was moved by this notion that, pub, that being in the public square requires true courage. We heard about that across the board in the conversation around polarization, and that it's one of the fundamental parts of being a citizen, especially in this highly polarized environment. And so that is also an important takeaway, and that we need to get comfortable with losing sometimes. That when we go into this area, into this arena and form, we've got to be comfortable with that. Third, and finally, um, I'll just kind of hit on this notion of being committed to democracy in America, just to simply point out how much, even though we didn't always talk about it, this issue of trust, trust in government, trust in institution, trust in your neighbors, really came across all of these conversations, right? When you talk about it in information literacy, there's an underlying distrust, and then it is fed upon through mis- and disinformation. Right? There are other ways in which we talked about even within the elections where you need to take that into account. So all of these things become really important, and we saw concrete examples of all of that throughout this morning's conversation. Three final thoughts in closing. First is um, we're going to spend this afternoon after our session uh, with the justices diving more deeply into all of these areas. So I hope that you look and find where it is that you can go to learn more, to dive more deeply. Similarly, you will also see a call for different civic actions in the agenda, and I hope that you have a chance to go look at that and see how it is that you can all civically engage. I was especially moved just now by Dan talking about how we need more civic role models. I know you're all civic role models already. I hope you actually take it the next step further. Think about how you're acting, but also how the people around you can be civic role models as well. So with that, I leave you with the final thought from Joe Kahn, who this morning said, it's actually not our young people's apathy we should be worried about, it's our own. I thank you very much. I look forward to working with all of you over the course of today and over the next year. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, we will now break for lunch. If you pre-purchased a lunch ticket, please proceed to the Continental Ballroom located on the third floor of the University Student Center across the street. iCivic staff are ready to lead guests from the auditorium lobby. The featured conversation with Justices Sotomayor and Barrett will take place in Betts Theater, located on the first floor of the University Center. Doors will open for security screening at 12.30 p.m. Your event badge must be visible for entry. And please take note, there are no restrooms and no food and drink allowed in the theater once you pass through security. Lastly, and as Raj mentioned, following the conversation with the justices, we will meet in breakout sessions. Please see your program for more information. Thank you and enjoy our lunch break. <laughs>